it's a real pleasure for me to welcome uh, Dr. Michael Gennaro back to the University of Florida. Uh, he's one of our alumni of, and he's currently an associate professor at Seminole State College and here in Florida. Uh, he has published in a number of journals, Journal of African Military History, International Journal of African Historical Studies. He's also uh, edited or co-edited a number of collected volumes, uh, including Sport and African History, Politics and Identity Formation, um, that came out about two years ago. Uh, so this is, you know, today's presentation is in that vein, uh, and it's called One Big Night, Dick Tiger and the Fight Over Nigerian Independence. So with that being said, Michael, welcome back, and you have the floor. All right. Thank you so much, Todd. I want to also thank the Center for African Studies for bringing me back virtually home to talk to the community uh, that helped raise me as a scholar and helped bring this research to fruition in so many ways. Um, so let me just share my screen uh, with everybody. Um, make sure that's on there. All right. Uh, so as the newspaper uh, itself alludes to, uh, the title of my talk today is One Big Night. Dick Tiger and the fight over Nigerian independence. Mike, I'm not seeing your not seeing screen. screen. Yeah. Let me try this again. Let's see if I can. Uh, oh, it's not, it's not showing the wrong one. How's that? Is that better? Uh, there you go. There we Perfect. go. All right. So this time, as the, the screen alludes to uh, with the newspaper, uh, my talk uh, is a one big night, Dick Tiger and the fight over Nigerian independence. So I want to start by telling you about this one big night at the Liberty Stadium in Abadan. On the 10th of August, 1963, Nigeria became the first sub-Saharan African country to host a world boxing championship fight. This would be the third and final boxing match between the former champion, American Gene Fulmer, and the then current middleweight champion of the world, Nigeria's very own Richard Ahechu, who fought under the brilliant nickname, Dick Tiger. In the first fight between these two, fox, two fighters in San Francisco in 1962, Dick Tiger had won the title on a points decision. Their second fight, which took place in February of 1963 in Las Vegas, Tiger was unable to defeat Fulmer convincingly, so it ended as a draw. Now, this second fight in Vegas produced no clear-cut winner, so in boxing terms, Fulmer could still dispute Tiger's title. So Tiger was still champion, sure, but since he was unable to defeat Fulmer for a second time and prove that he was indeed the, the champion, now there was going to be a third and final fight, this time in August in 1963, and it happened in Nigeria to determine who was going to be the undisputed middleweight champion. So as one newspaper put it, quote, when history comes to be written, it will record that 10th of August, 1963, witnessed the first world boxing championship ever to be staged in Africa. It will go down in boxing history that the Liberty Stadium, Ibadan, Nigeria, was the chosen venue among all the world stadiums that were considered, end quote. So as you can see, this newspaper writer was talking about me and was talking about this moment in specific here uh, at the Center for African Studies in a, uh, this presentation in a moment of prophetic wisdom. So despite this very poor attempt at humor on my part, uh, they were actually fighting for a lot of things beyond the actual world championship title. For Dick Tiger and the Nigerian government, there was a lot more at stake than simply winning the fight. The Nigerian government sponsored the fight financially, and for several reasons that I will get into later, spent maybe up to 7 million of the, today's dollars to host the fight. For Dick Tiger, this was an opportunity for him to be a national hero and heralded as a model Nigerian to showcase to the world. He was gonna showcase Nigeria as a modern country worthy of respect and his victory would help unify its citizens under one uh, national identity. And keep in mind that Nigeria had just gained full independence from Great Britain in 1960, just three years prior, but it had lacked a cohesive national identity. So both Tiger and Nigerian officials understood that a victory at home and a good showing at home would prove to the world that Nigeria and its new federal republic government 
was an independent success story despite some recent bad press. And I'll get into that in a minute. So this match then was intended to present a positive uh, image of Nigeria to the world and being progressive, those were their words. And it was hoped that it would bring foreign attention, foreign investment and publicity to the country. But in addition to this, Nigerian leaders also that it hoped that it would help in, um, internally unify the nation's different ethnic groups. It was hoped that Tiger's victory in Nigeria would answer the national question as they put it. The national question being, what is a Nigerian? And can the country rally around a national identity? And this was particularly pressing question in 1963, with a lot of effort on the part of Nigerians to craft a Nigerian identity through shared cultural, historic, and artistic endeavors. But Tiger's fight was different. It looked to sport and not to indigenous art or history or the past for inspiration. And lastly, just prior to this fight, political infighting within the action group, which was the Western region's ruling political party, led to violence in the Western halls of par parliament. The violence, which came to be known as the action group crisis, was widely broadcasted across the world, humiliating Nigeria and showcasing the internal divide and ethnic politics for all to see. So the federal gov government hoped that by paying for the fight and hosting it in Abad, in the Western region, that the fight itself would bring an increasingly divided nation back together. The fight was used as an attempt to unify the country under Dick Tiger's image of the ideal Nigerian, using sport as a tool of nationalism instead of history and tradition. So today I will be presenting basically the final chapter of my upcoming book, shameless plug, Champions of the World, Boxing, Masculinity and Empire in Nigeria, 1933 to 1966, which might be published by the end of 2022 if my toddler twins give me the time to revise and resubmit this manuscript. As this picture shows, Dick Tiger on the right was standing beside another Nigerian boxing world champion, Hogan Kid Bossy. And you might've heard of him, but Tiger followed in a line of Nigerian boxers that were successful international. And if you haven't heard of Hogan Bossy, we can discuss him later. But this talk today is about Tiger and his moment as champion. So I'm sure most of you are all well aware, Nigeria achieved political independence on October 1st of 1960 as the most populous country on the continent with new and largely, uh, so large and newly discovered oil reserves in the Niger Delta, the economic and political prospects of the country were indeed high. As an independent nation, Nigerians expected themselves to hold a leading position in African and world affairs, and others uh, held similar expectations for Nigeria. Thus it was dubbed the giant of Africa. Their example of independence was supposed to be a success story for how aspiring African nations could follow towards success. However, the decade that followed this independence in 1960, this decade which this tiger fight takes place, saw large amounts of corruption, violence, and several coup d'etats. And the decade, as some of you are well aware, ends with a civil war which lasts two and a half plus years killing upwards of possibly 3 million people. So Toy and Falola and Matthew Heaton described the decade as such, quote, the underlying cause of all the problems that Nigeria experienced in the 1960s and has experienced since then is often called the national question. What is Nigeria? Who are Nigerians? How does a country go about de developing a meaningful national identity? As we're going to see, this problem of Nigerian national identity was front and center to the government sponsorship of the fight between Dick Tiger and Gene Fulmer in Ibadan of 1963. So without going too deep into the history, um, it is important to know at least some of the politics at the end of the colonialism that shaped the early 1960s in Nigeria. Now, this is a topic that we can discuss for hours, as my Nigerian friends will happily attest to. So allow me a very quick overly generalized description so we can get back to what matters today, boxing. One of the major reasons for the government sponsorship of the third fight 
was an attempt to curb the developing regionalism and corruption on the federal level. We can see this as a continuation from the colonial era. The election that determined the federal government at independence gave the Northern People's Congress, the NPC, the largest share of federal seats. But in order to take uh, and to make a majority in the, the federal government, they crafted a coalition with the Nigerian Council of Nigerian Citizens, the NCNC, making this NPC, NCNC coalition the majority and the action group or AG, the official opposition party. Now, reports after the election detailed that there was, quote, unprecedented violence, thuggery, and increasing ethnic tensions, end quote. So to the world, Nigeria appeared faithful, uh, united on that fateful Independence Day, October 1st, 1960. But in reality, the federal government and the constitution uh, it rested upon were on a delicate foundation, divided by regional and ethnic conflicts over power and resources. The troubles that Nigerians faced ahead were multifaceted, but it can be explained partly with the division of regions and political parties. Now, I apologize for my map making skills. They aren't great, as you can see, and it is definitely not to scale in any fashion. But at least you can see sort of how this regionalization in Nigeria worked. So previous constitutions had originally channeled power and influence regionally, and thus they were done along ethnic lines. The various constitutions created by the British and sometimes with Nigerian input created a federal government with powers that devolved into three distinct regions. And these lasted through to independence into the fight period. And these three regions were the North, the East and the West. Each region had a large ethnic group that came to dominate politics of that region. House of Fulani in the North, Igbos in the East, Yoruba in the West. Now, in terms of population, these large groups were approximately two thirds of the population in each region and the remaining one third composed of various minority groups. But their political domination in each region uh, originated from a variety of factors. First, the political party system that developed under colonialism created three major parties that dominated politics in each region so much so that it was almost one party rule in each region through independence. For the NPC in the North, the NCNC in the East, and the AG in the West, the dominant ethnic group in each region also dominated party membership, made up the bulk of its leadership, and was tied to ethnic cultural groups in their respective regions. So this meant that while minority groups were a necessary and crucial part in each political party, their influence was often stifled because of the sheer uh, numbers of the majority. Again, this is a very general oversimplification for time purposes. But what's important, though, is that just as one group dominated each region, fear of being dominated at the federal level created an intense fight over national resources that could be siphoned into each region, or what Nigerians called tribalism or regionalism. And as such, regional identity and affiliations became stronger at the expense of a national identity as the regional governments were responsible for many aspects that directly affected the general populace. Complaints about how tribalism was destroying the country can be seen over and over again in the newspapers leading up to independence and in this era afterwards, as well as the fear of being dominated federally by other groups in powerful positions. This regional ethnic politics made membership in those ethno-political groups more desirable and more powerful than focusing on a national political identification. And as you can see, focusing inward is definitely not a recipe for creating a cohesive national identity. Others have noted this. When Nigeria became independent sovereign state in 1960, in many ways, it was a state without a nation. So how to create a national identity was, and to a certain extent still is, problematic. The Nigerian federal government in the 1960s tried to capitalize on this uh, tiger fight and his fame and his world championship status to begin crafting a national identity. To best understand why the federal government then was so willing to host and pay millions of dollars for the tiger former fight, 
we need to understand how this increasingly unstable political climate that I've been describing came to a head in 1962 with the action group crisis. So if you remember, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the action group was the head of the Western region in the official opposition party in the federal government. Now, one of the founding members of the action group was Chief Obafemi Awolawo, or Awo, and by 1959, his deputy was a man named Chief Samuel Akintola. And when Awo gave up the premiership of the Western region to contest for being the prime minister of independent Nigeria in 1959, he was succeeded, at premier, uh, he was succeeded by Akintola as premier of the Western region. Now, recent studies have shown that before 1959, these two were on the same page and had amicable relations. However, when Akintolas assumed premiership of the Western region and demonstrated his willingness to work with the NPC in the North, a group that Awo despised, a rift between them appeared and over time festered into mistrust and eventually violence. Ultimately, this internal divide in the AG didn't remain within the party. It reverberated nationally drawing the federal government into the fold in 1962 when violence broke out in the Western region. So long story short, Awo and a group uh, of his followers wanted Akintola removed and tried to vote him out. And this sparked violence in the Western region House Assembly 4 on May 25th, 1962. And I'll read you one description of the action. The House of Assembly met at 9 a.m. and after prayers, Mr. E. A. O. K., a supporter of Chief Akintola, jumped onto the table shouting, there is fire on the mountain. He proceeded to fling chairs about the chamber. A supporter of Chief Akintola seized a ceremonial mace and attempted to club the Speaker of the House. Several members continued to throw chairs and opposition joined in and there was such disorder that the Nigerian police released tear gas to clear the house. When the tear glass lifted, they tried to assemble again uh, to ratify the removal and fighting once again broke out with several ministers injured in the fray, including several being stabbed. It prompted newspapers to call this violence uh, a descent into quote, the wild, wild west. For several days, the Western region experienced fighting, riots, property damage, and of course, lawlessness. And at least this was the case, according to newspapers and official reports, and this was broadcasted across the world, some as far away as the New York Times. So in an effort to get to the bottom of this problem in the wild, wild west, a special commission of inquiry, the Coker Commission, was made to investigate the AG and Owl's running of the party with hopes of discrediting and dismantling their grip on Western power, although not the aim. The commission found that Awo and several others of the AG had misappropriated millions of pounds, essentially looting the Western region of money for the development uh, in its January 1963 report. Continued investigations revealed a secret plot to overthrow the government. So Awo and several of his closest allies in the AG were accused of treason, and the trial was national news well into September 1963, after the Tiger Fulmer fight of this presentation. All of this turmoil led many inside and outside Nigeria to question its status, its stability as a nation, the corruption at its center, and question the commitment of many of its leaders to the nation. As one newspaper commented several months later, quote, the crisis in the Western region can, dis can disintegrate a much desired unity of this country. Plans should be made now to quell the situation which will mar the reputation of our young developing country, end quote. So with this brief background, let's turn to the sporting world. Football was Nigeria's most popularly played sport, but at the national level, the team's dysfunction mirrored the political divisions we've been discussing. For example, in the middle of all the AG drama and just after the COCA report, the Nigerian national football team travels in January of 1963 to Dahomey in present-day Benin for an international match. This would be the first such meeting between these two newly independent nations. Nigeria fell behind early in the match and according to reports, quote, had to sweat out a 1-1 draw with the host side. 
This outcome dominates national newspaper sports section. And it was considered to be a huge, quote, national shame, as the newspaper alludes to, that a country the size and stature of Nigeria would ever concede a draw in football with Dahomey. The commentary after the match reveals the shame and anger among Nigerian sports fans. But for our purposes, it also exposes how football, again, Nigeria's most popularly played sport, was unable to unite Nigerians, and it hinted at the political situation. One sports commentator, Bonar Ekanem, lambasted the Nigerian national team that was held to a draw. The draw was the national shame, he said, reflecting the lengths that Nigeria as a sporting nation had to climb if it ever wanted to compete equally with football powerhouses in Europe and South America. He quickly reminded readers of the outside perception of, of its neighbors, uh, the per outside perception of Nigeria with its neighbors. Nigeria was known as being big for nothing. And that, quote, the Dahomey match has echoed this truth in this country in words that ought to make Nigerians shudder with shame, end quote. From the mid-1950s through this period in the 1960s, when the Nigerian footballers could not come together to win uh, against other colonies and later countries, it was often blamed on the part of Nigeria's different ethnic groups from across the country not coming together for the country that created this whole dysfunction. And this happens twice in 1963 when they uh, failed to make the Olympics and when they failed to make the African Cup of Nations. So in short, the language used to describe sporting failures reflected the ongoing anxiety about internal political divisions in the places of power between different uh, ethnic groups. And it also showed Nigeria's anxiety over its reputation on the world stage. So finally, here is where Tiger comes into the picture. So Dick Tiger, who was originally from Amaibo in Eastern Nigeria, moves to Liverpool in 1954 to pursue a boxing career. Tiger later moved to New York City from Liverpool in 1960, the year of independence, and he took up camp at Madison Square Gardens, pictured here. Two years later, his continued success against American fighters pushed him into the championship conversation. His popularity among American journalists and fight fans meant that he could no longer be sidestepped by the champion Gene Fulmer. Seeing the possibility in a big payday between two popular fighters, Tiger and Fulmer signed a, a fight in San Francisco in October of 1962. So in that bout, I've already said, square, uh, Tiger squarely beats Fulmer on a judge's decision, opening bloody gashes over both of his eyes en route to the victory. Yet his winning the middleweight championship was mired by other news about Nigeria that had dominated the newspaper since May of 1962, the ongoing AG crisis and the continuing Coker investigations into the AG treason charges. The outcome of the fight was actually better covered in U.S. newspapers. Not surprisingly, it took place there. And readers were told that when Tiger's victory was announced, he was carried on the shoulders of, quote, a group of Nigerians in native robes who performed an impromptu dance in the ring. End quote. This fight was closed circuited in over 40 American cities, but due to the location of the fight in the US, it was not played on neither TV nor the radio in Nigeria, although Nigerians received uh, updates on the radio on the BBC. After his historic win, Tiger had to have a rematch with Gene Fulmer as the stipulated in their fight contract. That fight, Tiger versus Fulmer 2, was set for February of 1963 in Las Vegas. The fight was expected to sell out because of how good the first fight was. So many people were expected to descend upon Las Vegas that visitors from Gene Fulmer's home state of Utah were warned to bring a sleeping bag and expect to sleep in hotel swimming pools. But this fight, like the first one in San Francisco, was not televised nor radio broadcasted in Nigeria, again making it hard for Nigerian fans and well-wishers to connect to the hype of the fight at the event. But it was better covered this time in the newspapers. Although he was tipped to win, Tiger and Fulmer fought to a draw in Las Vegas, Although many boxing critics considered the, this to be a bad judging decision by the referee and believed that Tiger should have been declared the winner. With no clear winner in their second match and the possibility of a third big fight with the potential of a lot of money, this set the stage for a third fight later in Nigeria in 1963. 
Tiger versus Fulmer three, to settle the score once and for all, the winner would become the undisputed middleweight championship. So in an effort to reclaim national pride and capitalize on Tiger's championship, a group of newspaper editors headed by the Nigerian Daily Times and reporters from newspapers across uh, Lagos suggested to fans that the next fight, Tiger versus Fulmer three, had to happen in Nigeria. They called it the fight at home movement and they pleaded for the federal government to pull all the strings to help in any way they can to bring this fight to Nigeria. One sports reporter noted uh, that it made clear that this third title fight was more than money. It was the life or death of Nigeria as a country. He told supporters, quote, Dick supporters all over Nigeria do not, however, think in terms of the wealth the champion is likely to accumulate in this next fight. They are clinging to his prowess as the only means to project Nigeria's personality across the two hemispheres. Tiger was needed to keep the international focus on Nigeria, since he was one of very few visible successes in an increasingly troubled and divided country. For many abroad, Tiger was Nigeria personified, and boxing as a sport has long had this as, a, uh, as, as something that fighters were. Fighters personified the nations that they were fighting for, and the more successful you were, the more successful your nation was. For many at home, they wanted this to stick. Less than a week after the Tiger uh, Fulmer II draw in Vegas, Nigerians began to politic for the fight to be in Nigeria. A.B. Osula, the acting chair of the Nigerian Football Association, and remember football is the most popular sport, even the chair of the Football Association wrote this, quote, the Dick Tiger issue is a national question and a challenge to every Nigerian, big or small. As we've discussed, the national question loomed large in Nigeria. The fight being held in Nigeria, Osula said, was about national pride, and he encouraged all Nigerians to demand their government to act to bring such an event home. The issue, as the issue of hosting the fight intensified, it became front page news for several months. Uh, for example, on March 7, 1963, the West African pilot printed a front page article that detailed the current negotiation and the stage of it for the fight. It let readers know that the federal government is indeed committed to this project. And it even set up a committee, the Dick Tiger Fight Campaign Committee, to secure this fight. The first order of business for the committee was to elect a chairman, and it was actually not elected, it was appointed. And they appointed the same A.B. Osula, and he was the one who sent the telegram to Tiger and to demand that he consider having the fight in Nigeria. He cabled the notice that the federal government was willing to underwrite the fight to the sum of 20,000 pounds, which is close to $500,000 today. And this was to guarantee against any losses that they might incur if they did not sell out or receive television contracts. Moreover, the federal government asked the governments of the different regions to chip in an additional 10,000 pounds each so that Nigeria would be able to guarantee 50,000 pounds, over a million dollars today. So this highlights how the federal government wanted each region to work together financially to make this fight possible. Every region then had a stake in the outcome and the spoils. They needed to unify the country around a shared symbol of Nigeria. And it was more than just national pride of having a world champion. Dick Tiger's victory in, in the Tiger Fulmer three fight would be a victory over and hopefully a pushback against the forces of regionalism. Consequently, beyond the federal government's efforts, uh, regular people were actually encouraged to contribute as well. The government needed to do all it could do to set the infrastructure for the fight. But one suggestion was that all Nigerians should donate one pound to cover the costs of the fight. Whatever the cost might be, here was an opportunity, it said, that all Nigerians should sacrifice towards, a sacrifice for the nation, and therefore a share in the glory of a possible Tiger victory as a nation. It was hinted over and over again in the newspapers that whatever the cost, Nigeria needed to host this, host this fight for a number of reasons that I have mentioned, and that all Nigerians needed to be a part of this effort. Now, although there were a few detractors in the newspapers, a few that said that the money being spent would be better spent on education or development, more often than not, people stood behind this decision and wanted the government to proceed. Tiger's victory then was a Nigerian victory in more ways than one. 
And in case you were wondering, although I can't find the de definitive amount, the total cost came out to be somewhere between uh, 150 and 250,000 uh, pounds, somewhere between three and $7 million in today's money. So the fight at home movement, this Dick Tiger fight at home committee uh, dominated the newspapers, as I said, as Nigerians were quick to point out what was at stake for the nation in the location and the outcome of the fight. It was a challenge to our country, as this new paper reported. Quote, Nigeria pins her hope on the great tiger for the projection of her personality throughout the world. The report went on. Imagine the massive publicity that will converge on Nigeria. It will only be second, perhaps, to the independent celebration of 1960. That publicity would have a double effect of bringing the world to see Nigerian advancement and development, as they called it, as well as unifying those at home behind a common hero. Now, the imagery of a second independence was intentional. In 1963, Nigeria had a debates and rewrote its constitution to change to a federal republic. And the debates over that were happening as the debates over hosting the fight. And the hope was that they wanted to sever many of the remnants of colonial government. This new constitution went into effect then on October 1st, 1963, three years to the day of independence and shortly after this fight. The fight committee actually nominated Lagos Racecourse, the site of Independence Day flag lowering in 1960, as the site for this fight. And this was also intentional. The fight was to be seen as a celebration of the latest version of Nigerian independence. And it's moved to being a republic. Asula again praised Tiger, noting that, quote, today, all of us, from ministers to cobblers and palm wine sellers, glorifying Tiger's achievements, and therefore all Nigerians needed to band together to bring the title fight home, physically to the site of independence. But before the, the fight could be set in Nigeria, Nigeria's manager, Jersey Jones, had to be sure that Nigeria was in fact developed enough and had the venues to be viable, to make this fight uh, viable. So he accompanied Tiger to Nigeria in March of 1963, and the federal government pulled out all the stops to bring the fight to Nigeria and to hype it to the world, to prove to Jersey Jones that this place was ready. Tiger, Jones, and party were met at the airport near Lagos, and they were met there by over 5,000 screaming fans, one report said, and then was driven to almost, uh, almost 10 miles to Lagos in an open car with fans who had lined up, the report says, the whole way to the city as dancers and musicians played along the way as this very dark photo, unfortunately, is supposed to show you. The route and the map were printed in all the newspapers days before so that the fans would be able to attend and find a spot where they could not only catch a glimpse of the national star and his manager, but also show the commitment of the Nigerians to such a fight. After a meet and greet with the Oba of Lagos, Adele II, the group retired and got ready for a, for a dance at the 7-Up compound at the Ajora Causeway, and it was sponsored by the Dick Tiger Fight Committee. At the press conference, this is what Tiger said, quote, it has been my wish to fight in my country, Nigeria. This will be a great pride for me. I also consider that a world title fight in Nigeria will give this country a great publicity and the effect on the outside world will be very encouraging, end quote. Now, Tiger might have just been saying the right things at the right time, but it clearly shows even Tiger was well aware of the political and social ramifications of hosting this fight in his home, Nigeria. In fact, one newspaper noted that if Tiger refused to actually hold the fight in Nigeria, then he would, quote, deliberately disgrace this country and the government of his country, end quote. Duly impressed by the receptions they received during their visits, the fighters and their managers agreed to stage the, site, the fight in Nigeria. Once the stage, or ring in this case, was set and the fight was signed for Nigeria, the government and Tiger set to work on making the fight a success. So longtime sportsman and the first governor general of Nigeria, Namdi Azikiwe, or Zeke as he was known, took special interest in the fight. Zeke was head of the NCNC, and it, which was the major party in the East, if you remember, but he was also himself a former boxer and a boxing lover. As governor general of Nigeria, 
he gave many speeches extolling the importance and role of sport in a healthy national polity beyond just this fight. In fact, Zeke gave a speech in May 1963 that highlights this drive for unity and the role of the fight towards such end. He stated that without unity in Nigeria, we shall not be able to hand down to our children and our children children the legacy of one country, which we of the present generation inherited from our forebears and former colonial rulers, end quote. His warnings of the dangers of continuing on this path of regionalization were not new, but the calls for political unity while promoting the fight like he did here were seen as one of the same. The goal is that Nigeria held an important place among African countries, one of high standing and hope. Other countries, he said, looked up to Nigeria and they envied her economy, her politics, and now with this fight in Nigeria, even envied her sporting success and turned for her to aid and inspiration. On a side note, one very interesting example of turning to Nigeria for aid was that when Tiger arrives home to be wowed him and Jersey Jones, Nigeria was also hosting Congolese General Joseph Mobutu, who in two years himself would come to power in a coup d'etat. Mobutu witnessed and participated in the return of Tiger uh, at this time, and the event and the hype must have stuck in his mind. When the opportunity came to host the Rumble in the Jungle between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman in 1974, Mobutu paid the unheard sum at the time of $10 million to the fighters to stage this fight and bring the world to the now named Zaire. It was a publicity stunt to showcase his country as a modern country, but it was one that Mobutu saw work in Nigeria 11 years prior. Even Muhammad Ali was aware of this situation in 1974. One of Ali's many, and I mean many, comments on the 1974 fight was this. Countries go to war to put themselves on the map, and wars cost a lot more than $10 million. Nevertheless, over the next several months leading up to the fight, Nigerian newspapers and radio commentary were flush with stories about the fight, the fighters, and impact for Nigeria, all while discussing the topics of loyalty, unity, the AG crisis, the new constitution, and a change to republicanism. Often on, they were on the same front pages together like these examples show. And as the fight contract neared completion, the location was moved from Lagos to Ibadan. And more on that later, but for now, it would be staged at the Liberty Stadium. And this is where the fight actually happens. The three regional governments did their best to make sure Nigerians could see or hear the fight and to show support. Zeke and many other politicians held press conferences when buying their tickets to the fight. Zeke himself purchased 10 ringside tickets, as did the deputy of the Western region. And he told Nigerian supporters to buy likewise, uh, for being uh, for the love of the country. The Eastern Region's Parliament declared a two-day holiday for civil servants and actually called for a political truce between parties so that they could actually attend and enjoy the fight without the worry of politics. The Northern government granted a four-day weekend and assisted in the cost of travel to a bottom. The government was actively wanting to make this a success. So on the day of the fight, the newspapers ran editions with their front pages devoted exclusively to the fight and to Tiger, including greetings from many high profile, profile well-wishers. Interestingly though, several pages had a full page ad image sponsored by the Western government written by the now reinstated premier of the Western region, Akintola, shown here. The caption at the top is missing and I apologize, but it read, and this was in all caps, toward a noble and rewarding venture in nation building. It was supposed to be an advertisement of the accomplishments of the Western government, yes, but the language in Thai to tiger and nation building is what's interesting. The Western government was taking great pride in hosting the fight, as well as how much development it as a region had achieved since independence. And part of its success, and of course, Nigeria's success in development had been, he reminded its readers, not neglecting the dedication to sports by the government. In fact, quote, 
It was fostering sporting spirits in her peoples, he said, and we can take great pride in the great tiger of Nigeria, who by his prowess has immortalized his name and placed Nigeria on the map, end quote. His message was clear. The fight would help both nation building through sporting spirit and showcase the good work and development of the Western region to the world. So I know what you're saying. You've been sitting here this whole time and I have yet to tell you who won this fight. So here we go. From the start of the fight, Tiger goes after Fulmer with ferocity and pluck. He hammers into him, into the corners. He counters all attempts to stop him. And at the start of the seventh round, the crowd is intense and they sense that this fight is almost over. As American Gene Fulmer stood from his corner at the bell, his face was bleeding in several places and it resembled, quote, a contour map of disaster with bumps and lumps for mountains and ridges and meandering streaks for rivers. With Tiger on the attack, he continually hammered into Fulmer, cutting his eye more and causing him to bleed profusely. Saved by the bell, Fulmer walked back to his corner, barely able to see from the swelling and the blood that was closing his eyes. Referee Jack Hart stops the fight. Tiger is declared victor by technical, technical knockout. As fans stream into the ring, the police had difficulty controlling the crowd, but they were eventually able to restore order. It took more than 10 minutes before the, dis the crowd was dispersed from the ring and the announcer was able to declare Tiger the winner. The victory set off a party uh, that went all night in, quote, virtually every hotspot around the country. And these were called victory dances. In fact, the Minister of Labor and Social Welfare, Chief Joseph Madupe Johnson, or JMJ, who was in charge of the sports for portfolio, himself sponsored a party, and he's seen here lifting Tiger after the victory. Uh, he sponsored a party, and he warned partygoers to bring your own dame and avoid disappointment. Greetings and congratulations to Tiger came from all corners, including the Prime Minister, Tefewa Balawa, who reiterated that Tiger, quote, had justified the action of the governments of the Federation in giving moral and financial backing to the promotion of the first world championship fight and contest in Nigeria, end quote. Praise for the fight and how Nigerians hosted it were reprinted in Nigerian newspapers for weeks to elicit pride. They were also made to promote the aims and desires of the federal government to, quote, hold their own in every field and endeavor, end quote. And these are the words of the Minister of Information, T.O.S. Benson, pictured here, who is a famous for his eccentric fashion styles and actually being an early supporter of MC Hammer Pants. But Tiger's victory was Nigeria's victory, Benson said, because Tiger's success at boxing, quote, punched Nigeria into world fame. In order to assert the Nigerian and indeed the African personality, he said, one does not necessarily need to be a politician, a scientist, or even a cosmonaut. Dick Tiger has projected the Nigerian African personality to the world today, end quote. Three days after the fight, the premier of the Western region, the newly instated chief Akintola, made a statement about the fight and its good works for Nigeria in rehabilitating the Western region. He congratulated Tiger on his, quote, excellent courage, speed and skill and speed and, and, and soundly defeating Fulmer and leaving no doubt that to the world that he was undisputed champion. Now, this was common amongst all dignitaries who expressed their praise for Tiger in one newspaper or another. But what comes next is perhaps even more important because it hints at why the fight was in Ibadan in the first place. This is what he said. I would also like to express on behalf of the government and people of Western Nigeria, our sincere gratefulness to the federal government for the spirit of sportsmanship, cooperation and selflessness, which has prompted this fight being held at our Liberty Stadium. Western Nigeria takes great pride in host of uh, playing host to the governor general, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe and his wife, Dr. Akpara and his entourage and the hundreds of our people from the North, the East, the federal territory of Lagos, and many foreigners from overseas. The statement here hints that the reason for the fight being hosted in Abadan rather than Lagos, beyond the obvious reasons of having a large and new stadium, was to bring the whole of Nigeria to the spot of the recent AG crisis and to promote unity. As Western Nigeria, this wild, wild West, was seen to be out of sync with the rest of the country, playing host to Nigeria and the world was an opportunity to reorient the region into the fold once again. 
that the various governments of the Federation should be thanked and congratulated was an overarching theme in the following weeks, as I said. The work of the government was done when the fight was over, but this new spirit of cooperation and feelings of Nigerianness needed to continue. In an open letter to the prime minister, it was asked, quote, after this great victory, I may call it world conquest, which Nigeria has a, a whole has spared nothing to achieve. Must the country rest on its oars as if there are no more regions to conquer, end quote? If the nation could rally to make such an event possible, it notes, surely the various governments could come together and make other significant changes in all aspects of the nation. Since the contest proved that Nigerians of different groups could come together as they did to support Dick Tiger and Nigeria, then it was indeed possible to do the same for all aspects of the nation beyond sport. Sport had the power, the letter said, to continue to give Nigerians common ground with which to come together and cheer for country and nation. And furthermore, the teams themselves would continue to quote, advertise the personality of Nigeria to the outside world as a force to be reckoned with. But this was only possible if the governments of Nigeria were willing to continue this association of the government and sport as a priority of national life. It required the different regions to work together by putting their differences aside and coming together on the sporting pitches and rings of the country, as well as in the hall of power. But like all good things, the glowing national feelings from the fight did not last long and national sporting victories rarely do. And the common cause that brought Nigerians together quickly fell from view. In the months following, the problems of crafting national unity and trust in a Nigerian nation began to wane once more. Several events happened that made this unity uh, and the fight for it difficult to capitalize on. In an unfortunate moment, the Nigerian television service that was in charge of filming the fight and then distributing the film across the country and the world accidentally lost or destroyed the film, losing a vital chance for those unable to come to see the fight uh, in the movie theaters um, across the country. Adding to this problem was that on September 12th, after a year of investigations, Awo and several other high party officials in the AG were found guilty of treason and sentenced to 10 years in prison. For some, the trial and sentencing were proof of the continued domination of Northern and Eastern Nigerians that they were subjecting on Westerners, hardening their resolve against other regions. Corruption continued in the country. There was a failed census uh, in 1962 and 63, and there was the carving of a new region out of the Western region, a Midwest region. And all of these things hardened and shook a lot of Nigerians' confidence in the federal system. But maybe the most, uh, in on my case, at least with boxing, Tiger's reign was short-lived. He lost the title just over two months after Nigeria became a federal republic. And it was a controversial decision, this loss to Joey Giardello. Tiger and many others thought that he should have won. Nevertheless, the loss was significant. Nigeria lost its only remaining sports world champion. They lost its national icon so soon after this fight. Tiger was unable to command another world title fight in Nigeria uh, to the detriment of hosting another such unity uh, event. So in the long run then, the fight did not unite Nigerians as the government had hoped, and Tiger's win over Fulmer quickly fell from public memory. And it is with this in mind that we can better appreciate the 1964 New, Day, New Year's Day speech by the newly appointed president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Dr. Namdi, Namdi Azikiwe. His title uh, speech was Eight Paths to Unity. He celebrated how far the country had come, but also warned of the pitfalls of disunity that the country was currently heading towards. He gave a heartened appeal to all Nigerians. The speech also noted that Nigerians were behind in several economic and industrial developments, which in combination to their sporting failures, alluded to general fears that Nigeria was progressing and developing too slowly. However, the thrust of his speech was how Nigerians needed unity and the country needed to find proper sports men and women if they could be found. And then crafting a deeper love for the country. It was possible, as Tiger example has shown, he said. He said that, quote, Nigerian sports men and women, the spirit of modern international sports has now transformed the athlete into a devotee of sport who loves his country more. So Nigeria needed to regain the acclaim 
that Tiger's victory bought because more than simply a title, the prestige, honor, and unity it provided, however fleeting, was worth the effort and the saving grace, uh, in Zeke's words, of the country's image. If Nigeria were ever to overcome the political situation, the government had to continue to sponsor sports to, quote, cultivate higher love for their country, said Zeke. Through international victories, Nigeria would see a common focus of unity, an idea of Nigerian that transcended the ethnic divides. Thus, through his first speech as president of the Republic of Nigeria, Zeke was able to detail many of the problems facing the country, with unity being one of the single most important issues to many political and economic leaders, and how sport was, in one case, a remedy. So the first Republic of Nigeria is often noted for its failure to undo the forces of regionalism, corruption, and political mistrust that colonial politics created, uh, and leading the country, unfortunately, on a path towards civil war in 1967. And to a large degree, this was the case. The example of Tiger and boxing highlights the various ways in which the Nigerian government attempted to answer the national question by using a sporting event to simultaneously try to unite Nigerians around a desirable male world conqueror of sport, and also to project such aspirations and celebrity to the international world. In the end, however, Nigerians were unable to maintain that unity or focus themselves into a collective national uh, identity on the national scale. And Nigeria's problems with disunity and mistrust at the center, coupled with the regionalism and tribalism fell victim to a civil war. In fact, it was a civil war in which Dick Tiger went from being the hero of Nigeria to the villain of Biafra. Dick Tiger would win the World Light Heavyweight Championship in 1966, but this time he wouldn't fight for Nigeria. He would fight for another country. He was now Dick Tiger of Biafra and he wanted to put them on the map. But that's a discussion for my next Barraza. But for now, I wanna play you a song, just a little bit of it that says, well done to Dick Tiger. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, we have about 35 minutes for questions or comments from the room. So I'm waiting for someone to raise their hand. Okay, I've got a question from Vivian. Uh, I've just switched you over to panelists. So it might take a second for that to show up, um, but you can turn your video on if you so desire. So in 2020, or maybe in the last few decades, if you were to ask, or if I were to ask a Nigerian who they were, how would they answer? Um, so um, in, in many cases, um, it is very much still um, very much regionally based, um, but it, it has changed over time. And this has a lot to do with um, the different political structures sort of afterwards. So after the coup d'etats, there's several military governments. Uh, there's restructuring of Nigerians um, to different states uh, and different constitutions. Uh, and so that has, has moved in flux. Nigerians recognize themselves as Nigerians and from countries uh, in Nigeria, um, but with so many different uh, languages uh, and ethnicities in, um, in the country itself, the Nigerian identity uh, itself um, might not be number one in most people's hearts. 
right? It might be below their own uh, other identity um, within that. But that's not to say for everyone, right? That's a that's an individual sort of thing, uh, depending on, I guess, uh, status and prestige uh, and what they have uh, in the country uh, themselves, right? But the the linking of of regions in this case um, changes over time. Thanks for that. Uh, do I have another hand? Okay, uh, I see one from Tyler. Okay, Tyler, I'm switching over to panelists, so go ahead and welcome back to Gainesville, virtually. Hello. Um, hey, Tyler. I have, uh, I have a question, I have two questions. Um, one is, how does the West African pilot factor in throughout this? Like, did, uh, is is the paper's coverage of the fight and everything leading up to it different than the rest of the newspapers in Nigeria? Uh, just because I'm asking that because of Azakiwe only having a stake in West African Pilot. Um, mm -hmm. Secondly, mm -hmm. I'm interested if there's much discussion of the North in in the North kind of sending um, congratulations or the uh, messages of uh, promotions or things like that, that I'm just wondering where the North um, kind of plays into all this. Okay, uh, two good questions. Um, so first, uh, most of the newspapers that you saw were from the West African pilot. And that was only because uh, I had a um, hard drive malfunction. Uh, and so the hard drive that has the West African pilot survived, but the hard drive that has the Nigerian Daily Times uh, and other newspapers, unfortunately, uh, did not. So I had fewer from those uh, from the time. I feel your period. pain. I feel your pain. I just yeah, I, this is the, the problems of technology, right? So with the pandemic and being unable to actually go out and get the things that I need from these, uh, from the other newspapers to, to show a breadth of it. Uh, so I, you know, stating that out front. Um, so the West African pilot um, is not alone in its promotion for the fight. They are very much producing a lot of what Zeke is saying. And because the different newspapers are very much um, ethnically backed uh, or supported by different ethnic groups about, who, about who's reading from where, um, you see a lot less of his speeches in the Nigerian Daily Times as you would in the West African pilot. Uh, but that doesn't mean he didn't give the speech, right? He gives the speech, it's just printed in, in one newspaper more detailed than it would be in another newspaper. Um, but the West African pilot uh, from its inception in 1937-38, uh, uh, when Zeke is actually the editor of this paper, um, boxing is in its very first edition and boxing uh, is heavily in um, the newspaper coverage. Um, and it takes several years after World War II for the other papers to climb on board um, once boxing reaches an incredible popularity, uh, especially starting in 47, 48, 49, when boxing starts to reach a, a much broader audience. Um, so the, the boxing is actually in all three papers. And um, what I found in all three papers, especially when discussing uh, the failures of football, um, was... Uh, lots of times it would often go into some bickering. And when you read like the, the section of like letters to the editor, uh, it would often say, why wasn't so-and-so player from this region added instead of this person from the North or this person from the West? Um, because, you know, the, why are we doing this sort of tokenism? Or, and, so, and that kind of stuff um, permeates, especially when Nigeria loses and loses bad on the international stage, um, especially when it comes to football, because uh, the, a huge scandal hits football um, right before uh, colonialism ends uh, in about, I think it's 58 or 59, there's a scandal and money is being siphoned off the top. And uh, the, this caretaker committee has to come in and soccer loses its prestige, at least in, in our football loses its prestige in that uh, aspect. Um, and it becomes sort of, um, well, look how bad it's being run. It's being run because of these leaders and that no wonder we can't win anything and look how poorly they're choosing our teams and stuff like that. So the, the newspapers are, are all on board with sports. Um, and at least what I present, at least in my research, is that while football is the most populously played sport, um, boxing is where Nigeria sees actually the most success. And it actually is the one that 
garners the most attention on the international stage and garners the most attention uh, sometimes in the press um, with in terms of, uh, of pictures uh, and stuff like that. Um, so that, that, that's at least sort of the, the, the Zeke compartment uh, of it. He gives up um, his editing ability uh, early in the 50s when he takes over um, control of the NCNC uh, and runs for the Western region uh, government, but it is run by people chosen by him to be um, the editors uh, of this. But sports is a very important aspect to it. And the West African pilot brings sports uh, into all of the papers as an, as a, as an important uh, aspect of that. Um, and I talked too much on that one. What was the second question again, Tyler? I apologize. Uh, oh, the North. You were talking yeah, about the North. North. Yeah. Okay, I apologize. I apologize. It took me a second. I got twins and my brain doesn't work as well as it should. So um, I did give a speech uh, from the Prime Minister uh, from the North, Balewa, uh, about how he was proud that the federal government had actually done this, that they had given their support and this was a great showing for Nigeria. But he wasn't alone. Um, the newspaper for several days afterwards uh, is filled with this sort of stuff, right? So the Northern region... Um, governor at the time, uh, Abdu Bello, he sends out his congratulations, uh, as well as from MPs, um, uh, members of parliament um, from all across uh, Nigeria. So the, the North is uh, very much happy um, with this, at least the political, those in, in power uh, are, um, the fight sells out. Uh, and I can't, I haven't been able to find out sort of which region brings more people to the fight. Uh, itself, but being in Abadan meant that it was on the rail line, and it was um, and rail rates were very cheap for people to go uh, to see it. It was broadcasted over the radio, uh, and unfortunately, the film doesn't survive, so people can't uh, actually see it afterwards. Um, but uh, the the northern region, you know, once once the federal government's on board, and it, the federal government is basically under the power of the NPC, the North, um, they're the ones running the show. They're the ones who okay it, right? So the fact that they okayed it and put the money forward uh, to it uh, is very telling in itself. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, thanks Tyler. Um, next question from Cariola. Um, I'm moving over to panelists. So Cariola, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Can I go ahead? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, that was a beautiful presentation. And um, I think I want to commend the we you were able to sustain my, um, <laughs> you were able to sustain, you know, everyone. I mean, I was looking forward to, okay, what's coming next? What's coming next? And um, as a Nigerian, I, I could say, um, to the best of my knowledge, I think I could say you were actually 95% accurate, if not 100% accurate. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, everything you pointed out are true, very, very true. But um, the comment I just want to make is this question of identity is something um, that uh, it, it's something that's still real. Many Nigerians you know, with the question of identity. And I think I would appreciate, I had the privilege of working in the newspaper. I work with Punch newspaper before coming to the United States. And um, from my insider's knowledge, I could say, you know, this question of identity is something we are still struggling with. If you ask me, oh, where are you from? Uh, well, I could tell, I could just in Nigeria based on, you know, formality, but if I want to be honest with you, I'm going to tell you, okay. Did we lose? I think we lost his signal there. Oh, he's, he's back. We lost oh, you briefly there, Cariola, but continue. Oh, oh so, okay. So it's, it's the same feeling I get from my colleagues in the United States and other parts of the world. So I would so the comment I want to make is I would really appreciate if someone like you, I've read your biography, I mean, it, it's awesome. If someone like you could actually do a contemporary study of, you know, the Nigerian identity in the 24th century or, you know, in um, 2021. So I think if someone like you should, you know, do it, you are not African, it would gain more credence than if someone like me should do it. So that's just a comment I want to make. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, uh, and I, I appreciate uh, being backed up. Uh, that my, my uh, initial reaction was <clears throat> in terms of Nigerian identity. Uh, and um, I think what's really interesting about sort of this time period and, and creating a national identity and the fact that Nigerians still struggle uh, with this and the continuing of breaking up into more states, um, as well as you know Nigerians moving between political parties and stuff, makes it a very um, makes it very timely, uh, I think, and it's it, it resonates because uh, Nigerians still feel this uh, detachment to the nation state um, over sort of where they are from within the nation itself. Thanks for that comment. Uh, another question from Vivian Lordline. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Gennaro, mm -hmm. uh, two parts. Uh, what happened to Gene Fulmer and these fights took place in an era of great racial turmoil in the United States. Was mm -hmm. there any backlash against him or the fights, et cetera? Uh, those are great questions. Uh, so Gene Fulmer, uh, this was the last fight of his career. Um, he, Tiger beat him up pretty bad. Um, there was worry that he was going to lose his sight um, if he continued fighting. Uh, and by this time, he had he had already had a long uh, and prosperous career. Um, he retired to his mink farm in Utah afterwards, uh, and he lived uh, several decades um, uh, afterwards. I remember him giving, um, I think the last time that I saw one of his uh, interviews about this uh, was in the 1970s. And he said that, you know, Tiger beat me. He beat me so bad. There was no way I could have won that fight. Uh, my mother and my wife could have been the judges that night. And I still would have lost this fight is one of the things that he had said. Uh, so he, un, you know, which is very rare for a boxer. He understood, he read the writing on the wall that he was past his prime, that he had been a champion. He had been a good champion, but he had now run into somebody who was better uh, and to continue fighting was going to be detrimental to his health. Um, so that's, that's sort of what ends up happening to Fulmer. Uh, Fulmer's brother was also a boxer. And I believe it's after this fight, uh, two or three fights later, that Tiger actually fights his brother and beats him as well. Um, but this again, this happens uh, after he's lost the title um, in, his, in Tiger's um, trying to climb up the ranks again. He, he defeats Fulmer's brother uh, at the time. Uh, in terms of... Um, racialized backlash that Tiger himself would have felt, um, he, he would have been very much aware of the, of the racial uh, aspects of this, right? Especially with um, Muhammad Ali uh, and the way that Ali was being treated. And what's really interesting about this and the backlash that Tiger himself actually feels um, is when Tiger, when the civil war starts and Tiger sides with uh, with Biafra uh, and fights uh, as Dick Tiger of Biafra, um, he joins Muhammad Ali uh, as two fighters who are now fighting against their governments to make changes based on race. And part of the civil war was this idea that um, the domination of uh, non nebos were gonna come and kill people in the East of Igbo origin uh, and this was a genocide uh, against them. This was a racialized uh, fight. Um, and Ali goes to jail. I'm sorry, Ali is world champion, like world heavyweight champion at the same time that Dick Tiger is light heavyweight champion, like one notch below. Um, and by 67, 68, as Ali's fighting against his government's stance on the Vietnam War about the treatment of black persons in America, uh, of, of about race in itself, Dick Tiger's fighting a similar um, publicity battle, but he, it actually gets drowned out a lot by Tiger, but they're both in the U S at the same time fighting against their governments uh, and fighting against what they perceive as a, as a racialized uh, fight. So this is a, a great segue into the, um, or a great reason why I should come back center for African studies and Todd uh, to give another Barraza, but this time on uh, Dick Tiger during the civil war uh, and what, and his role in relationship with Muhammad Ali. Um, but he, when when in the U.S. he did it, he did experience the racism that was there. It wasn't um, it wasn't something that he could avoid. Um, the way that he could get out of it, um, and many Nigerians also expressed this, um, was being able to uh, speak with an English accent, um, and and their spe their specific um, accent made it uh, made a difference 
although I'm not sure very much, uh, but he was definitely treated differently as a boxer and being at least in the public eye in most places. Um, similar to how probably Ali would have been or other boxers had Ali not taken the stance against the US government um, that he did. Um, so. Thanks for those questions. Uh, anyone else want to raise their hand? I've kind of got a question for you, Mike, um, and that is about sort of mobility and migration of boxers um, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, I mean, nowadays, you, we think of it much more commonly regarding international footballers mm -hmm. um, from Africa playing in, in leagues all over the world. Um, but I believe it still is happening with boxing um, in, in, a, in perhaps smaller numbers, uh, much less studied and well known. But can you sort of maybe talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how does Dick Tiger wind up in in Liverpool and New York, and what's Hogan Bassey doing at, in in those years? And are are these really uh, you sort of very unique examples, or are they part of a, a larger pattern uh, of international mobility and migration? Uh, during those years, uh, this is a this is an excellent question, uh, and this is another topic that we could have a barrage on, if I might add. Uh, so, starting in the, in the late 1940s, uh, Great Britain or the British Empire um, loosens the restrictions on um, uh, citizens of the empire, and that is their designation um, that they can now move across the empire. Uh, a lot more freely than before. And this is tested with the Empire Windrush, which brought uh, Jamaican migrants to, um, to England in, in 1948. Um, but that loosening of uh, restrictions, the post-war world in which boxing is a very popular pastime uh, in the 1940s and 50s, and the connection to Liverpool. Now, Liverpool is the port of empire at this time. This is where the majority of goods coming to and from England from its own empire, especially in the Caribbean uh, and in West Africa, that's where the majority of companies are. And that's where um, those who are working on the boats, especially uh, those of Nigerian um, origin, that's where they're stopping. And so Liverpool has a huge presence in Nigeria. And many of the people who come from Liverpool um, to work in Nigeria are boxing fans. And it, there's a very easy reason for this. Nigeria has a long, or sorry, Liverpool has a long history of boxing. It's the first place in England that has a boxing dedicated stadium. The Liverpool stadium was for boxing only. Um, and the reports at the time say that it was one of the smokiest places in the world. And you'd be, you'd be haphazard to actually see the fighters actually fighting. Uh, but it was a fighter's place to go. So these Britishers come to Nigeria and they help set up boxing um, and the Nigerian Boxing Board of the Control is actually set up in part by a man named Douglas Collister. And Collister is now um, seeing that, that there are some Nigerians with great potential as boxers, but Nigeria is not set up yet to have world-class fights or to create world beaters, as they would call them. So Collister and a few others, uh, and a man named Jack Farnsworth uh, was among them, they start uh, sending boxers from uh, Lagos to Liverpool. Now, Nigerian boxers were also going to places like London, um, and they were also going um, to other venues, but in Liverpool, they found the most success. And they found the most success there um, because they were able to tap into the boxing networks uh, that were there, um, but they were also... Um, in a community of not only Nigerians, but also other peoples from the British Empire who settled in Liverpool. So Liverpool becomes this cosmopolitan place filled with people from across the empire. And boxers there actually get a lot of success. Uh, so there are a lot of Nigerians that I've uh, documented um, in the upcoming book, shameless plug, that, will, uh, that talks about their move to Liverpool to become uh, world champions. So Hogan Bossy is one of the first, and he actually becomes um, the most successful until Dick Tiger arrives. Uh, but before him, um, the boxers like Sammy Wild, uh, who is known as the Ebony Dynamite, as boxers like Israel Boyle, who is known as Battling Boyle. Um, there were several who make this trip to, and they get 
you know, full-time jobs working on the do at the docks or they're working in paint factories or they're working as mechanics, but they're also boxing in hopes of becoming a world champion. Um, they're denied, and again, maybe this gets back to the racism question that I was asked a second ago. They're denied the ability to fight for the British championship because of their race. There is a glass ceiling um, on that. And then once that ceiling is actually broken, also in the late 40s, they are only able to fight for a new championship that's created, the British Empire Championship, uh, for this reason. So this is the first time they're able to fight for this, uh, and they actually start winning it, you know, bringing into question how great the white man in this empire actually is if they're being beaten by their own subjects. So we start seeing this movement of not only Nigerian boxers, but I've also traced a whole host of boxers that came from places like Trinidad, that came from places like Jamaica, that came from... Um, from all over the British Empire. Um, so we see this, this movement of boxers uh, as part of a larger migration. Um, and this is what I detail in my work uh, as the physical space of the Black Atlantic. So the Black Atlantic, which is obviously, it's the movement for those that don't know, it's the movement of ideas across um, the Atlantic Ocean uh, of slavery and other things uh, between black persons, between England and, and the African coast and so forth. Um, but most people would have been hard pressed to know some of the great critical thinkers that were making this trans, uh, making this Black Atlantic um, possible, but they knew boxers. They knew, and this was why I mean it's the physical space. This is where these ideas are actually being fought out in the ring over race and racial supremacy. Um, and fighters like Joe Lewis are a part of this, and so is Dick Tiger. Um, so this this is where all of this movement um, is happening. But once you became a British Empire champion. Um, you couldn't fight for the European championship. You can only fight for a world championship. And the only way to do that is to go to the US, which had by the 1960s um, become the boxing and Madison Square Garden, especially become the boxing Mecca. That's where you had to go. And that's where you had to do it. So that's where Tiger goes. Um, but Hogan Bassi, uh, he loses. So in 57, um, I had given a talk actually for the Center of African Studies during the SIRSA conference several years ago on how Bassi's win at the uh, World Championship happens at the same time that Nigeria is actually getting self-determination. Um, and so these the debates over both are happening at the same time, similar to what we just saw with Tiger in the change to republicanism. Uh, but Bassi loses his title in uh, 1959. And so the, the picture that I had shown you uh, was late in 1958, where Bassi and Tiger are holding their world championship uh, trophies. Tiger is holding the British Empire trophy. Um, and the two of them, uh, well, Bassi loses uh, twice to Davy Moore, uh, and he's unable to fight after 1959. And Bassi is actually one of the promoters for this fight that we just talked about in Nigeria, which started his promotional career um, afterwards. So. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we have uh, another question from Norma. Uh, Norma, I'm switching you over uh, to panelists. So in a moment. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, very excellent overview of Nigerian history. I learned a lot. I appreciate that. Um, the major question I have is recently I saw that there's still in Nigeria quite a bit of interest in um, boxing, I think just maybe four days ago, I saw something where, um, is it Ali Bash maybe, accused a Nigerian minister of graft or corruption and keeping some big uh, fight from going through there. And I was wondering, is boxing still as major for the country as it once was? Does it have as large of an impact upon the population or, well, probably not that large of an impact, but is it still quite central to the sporting and the social arena and political in Nigeria today? Great question. So um, I, I think you're referring to, it's actually the other way around, it's Bash Ali, who was a uh, world heavyweight champion of, a, of his own um, <clears throat> of a previous decade. Um, so he's also very outspoken. So anybody who knows Bash Ali is, is uh, very outspoken uh, about what he sees uh, and what he thinks. Uh, it, it happening in Nigeria. Uh, but to, to get to, so boxers, especially if you win world titles, uh, people are going to listen to you. You know, you, you've earned enough fame that you can say uh, things, not that everyone's going to listen to you, but you will, you will be listened to and heard of. Um, but boxing in Nigeria, um, and this is sort of um, a book project, if, uh, if I have time, if the twins allow me to, that would happen after this one finally gets finished. Um, so what happens after Dick Tiger 
uh, and 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 Biafra basically. Um, Dick Tiger siding for the other side, the non-Nigerian side of uh, the Civil War, um, hurts boxing's reputation and it hurts boxing's uh, ability. Um, it is now seen as something dangerous. Um, and so boxing never fully recovers from that time period. And a lot of that has to do with obviously Tiger going in that direction. Um, but world boxing also takes a different sort of turn, right? Um, the British title is uh, empire title is now the Commonwealth title. It has even lower standing than it did before. Um, the, the, the pipeline to England is no longer um, there in most cases. Um, so unless you are of Nigerian descent and born in England, um, there was less likely to give a chance from, of you leaving the continent. Um, and there's also the problem that decades of military rule um, and political corruption um, meant that the government was going to put less and less money into sport unless they knew that that sport was actually going to produce something for the nation. Um, and boxing wasn't seen to do that. And especially because of Tiger's stance, um, the, the military government that comes out of uh, that time period um, starts to shy away from boxing. Now, to be fair, a few years after the Civil War ends, Muhammad Ali comes to Nigeria uh, and says what a wonderful job this government is doing. Um, but this was, you know, it, it wasn't a boxing trip, if that makes sense, right? He wasn't there to box. He was there on a, on a trip. He was, he was going around the world uh, himself. So in the interim then, boxing doesn't have the same support as it did in the 50s and 60s when it was a sport that was tied to many different things for the nation. It was tied to boys clubs. It was tied to youth and juvenile delinquency. It was tied as a, as a way for uh, something for people to go out and do on a, on a Saturday night, right? So it, it had a lot of cachet that it loses once the war, the civil war is done, military com governments come in um, and the world sort of sees what happens to Ali. By the end of the seventies and early eighties, Ali is a shell of himself. And less and less people are actually willing to go into boxing, seeing how detrimental it has been to Ali's health. And I would argue to a large extent is the reason why boxing has never sort of gained that appeal again. You could also argue the fact that there's 15 different governing bodies and everybody and anybody can be a champion at any given time also makes boxing a little bit less appealing um, than it used to be when during this time there was basically two governing bodies. Um, and most of the time they were in concert with who was the world champion. So we, we start, we start seeing boxing take a spill and Ali and his health doesn't help that. Um, and Nigeria continues to box, but it sort of, you know, it goes up and down, right. And some, some time periods, there's more people who are wanting to box. And I think it has much to do with location and former boxers. Is there a former boxer there that's willing to coach? Um, who's willing to coach for the nation and the national team? Or is there a boxer? Are there boxers willing to, to sacrifice their time um, in a country where it's hard to make money um, in order to do this, right? So if I'm going to do something for the detriment of my body, am I going to do it in boxing where I might not make any money or fame, or am I going to do something else, right? So there's a lot of factors into why it's not to the same acclaim, but Nigeria still produces world champions into the 2010s. So it's not that they aren't doing it, but it's not to the same level as it has been. Thanks. Thanks for that. We have reached pretty much the end of our session in any case. Uh, so I wanna thank Mike for joining us today. It's great to have you back. Uh, yes, there's ideas there for three to four more barrazas um, <laughs> easily. Um, and, uh, you know, in the meantime, maybe, maybe there'll be another conference here that we can collaborate on um that sounds great you, you yeah. tell me when we're going to have a sports conference and, and I'll, I'll write something on on a great nigerian nickname from superhuman <laughs> power to bad medicine <laughs> yeah, uh, there there was a lot of those if, if i recall correctly um so thanks everyone for joining us today